Welcome to Acoustic Wisdom, where we take ancient and modern wisdom and we smash it into acoustic music. Today we're going to take a look at Doc Watson, the legendary Doc Watson, and a quote from Ibn Arabi. Thanks for stopping by Acoustic Wisdom today. We're going to take a look at Ibn Arabi. He is a Sufi mystic, which is a little redundant. Uh, he is a philosopher. He is a poet and has 800 works, and there are a 100 of them that are still around in their fullest form. And definitely check out his stuff. I'll put a link down in the description, and uh, you can check out more about what he has to say. And the quote goes like this. All that is left to us by tradition is words. It's up to us to find out what they mean. So it's up to us to figure out what they mean. So how does this relate to music? So if you think about musicians of the past, all that they have left to us are notes. And it's up to us to figure out what they mean. So most people are going to listen to these and they're just going to let the sound kind of wash in and they hear it and they say whether they like it or not. But if you're a musician, you're going to need to know what do those notes mean? Where do they come from? When that was written, how did they write that? Did it just like come forth and they just, you know, uh, the piano toppled over and the notes fell out and they just kind of assembled it and now they got this masterwork? No, that didn't work that way. So when there are certain things that happen in music, we as musicians have to figure out what do they mean? What is the, how does that fit in with the rest of the context of the music? How does this lead to this? How does this lead to this, to this, to this, to this? Because everything in music is always leading to the next thing. And uh, when we understand how that works and how those certain things affect people's emotions how um, they affect what they're thinking. Maybe it affects their brain state. You know, there is plenty of meditation music out there that's specifically made to make the brain go into different states. You have, you know, the delta state, you have the theta state, the alpha state, the beta state, the gamma state, all of these things. And there are certain frequencies and certain uh, tempos and all of those things. They can make our, our, the way that we think, our stress levels, our awareness levels, our creativity levels, all of those things can change by what we are feeding into our system. And as a normal listener, we just suppose and assume that whoever's making this stuff knows what they're doing. That's fine. If you are a creator and you are um, a composer, want to be a composer, a songwriter, anything like that, understanding what is happening in there is so important. So, with the Doc Watson section that we're going to do in this video today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is he doing? Like, why is this thing that he's doing, why does it work? Why is it, um, you know, why is it lasting all these years that people just keep going back and listening to it? Now, obviously, he's not selling millions and millions of albums. But there is uh, a certain section of people that just, like, Doc Watson's on a pedestal, right? I mean, it's like, this is, this is the dude. So um, we're going to talk about that, and I want you to pay attention to, to music in a different way. You know, this week, after you listen to this video, listen to what's happening, listen to what's going on, and go, well, what is that? What is that? What is that? What is that? There's, there's a musical phrase there. Why did that work? What is it being, uh, how is it relating to the chords that are being played underneath the melody or the uh, the soloist. How is the drum section working with the rhythm section? How is the bass fitting in with what the drums are doing? Or how's the keyboard doing this? You know, all of these different things. So think about that. Understand. You might, if you haven't learned any music theory, you might want to find. I don't know. Music theory for idiots, music theory for dummies, whatever there is out there that you can get get a hold of and just get a little bit and, and get that understanding and figure it out. 
have somebody teach you. I always say this, find somebody that can teach you these things because you will learn it faster because a book isn't going to answer your questions readily. It's just going to spit out information to you. Um, but it's up to you to figure out what it means. So up next, let's look at Doc Watson, Little Sadie up next. So now let's check out Little Sadie by Doc Watson. And this song was done on the second album of Doc Watson, his second solo album. But this one wasn't really a solo album as much as it was with a, a collaboration with his son, Merle Watson. And there's a festival that was done in tribute to Merle, who had died in a farming accident, called Merle Fest. And if you ever get a chance to go to Merle Fest, I highly recommend it. It's been a while since I've been, but I used to go every year, and it's an amazing, amazing music festival. And so Little Sadie, this is in D minor, and there are a number of things that I want to talk about, N not just play the song for you or play the, the intro part that Doc plays, which I think is really cool. I want to show you the, the intro and then how he sort of embellishes that, but then there are little things within there that I want to talk about so, so that you can understand how um, he's going about it and why does it sound good. And... Um, and the techniques that are being used in there. So here let's play, this is the very intro of Little Sadie, and again we're in D minor, so it starts off like this. So I played it twice through right there, and Doc only plays it once, and he plays it in between each of the verses. And there are some things that Doc does that I want to talk about, some technique things. And in the tab, I had tabbed it out note for note, and so things cer certainly change because he's not being very precise in here, and that's kind of why it sounds the way that it sounds, at least to me. There are some things that have to be exact, and in other things, not so much, especially in the cross-picking sections. And so let me play this a little bit more slowly, and, and then we'll talk about it. So here we go. Okay, the first section here, out of D minor, but he's actually holding this F position. So check this out. So when you go, so he's letting that ring. So he's playing out of a chord position, and this is very important. He's playing solo guitar, it's just him and a guitar, so why not let all of those notes harmonize together? And, and rather than going, he goes, and lets that ring. That's really nice. And then uh, he goes... Uh, right into this D minor. So you have this F chord and he, and he just brings his pinky down or third finger down. I'm not sure what he used there, but um, brings this down for the D minor. So there, there's an A minor chord happening, but he plays A minor 7, you know, because you get more ringing action here, and, and then he's going right into the C chord. So it makes a little bit more sense, technique-wise, to go from the A minor 7 right into the C as opposed to playing a true A minor. So I think the A minor 7 sounds better. And so let's talk about how he's cross-picking this. So on the, uh, the A minor, he's picking the bass note. And then, instead of picking a single note, so if I, if I played this single note-wise, I'd play it like that. 
but he's picking the bass note and then he's getting two notes at once after that. So there, there's the third and the fourth string together on an upstroke. And then the second and third string together on a downstroke and the first and second string together on the upstroke. So that has a more of a chord, almost a strumming sound. And to me, this kind of harkens back to uh, Travis picking, where, you know, like Doc does this. Right? So rather than doing single notes with the thumb, some people will play this even like a folk style. You know, single note. But if you look at the Travis style, the bass note is one. And then there's like two notes, and then a bass note, and then two notes. So you get more of this sound. So it, it's a little bit more of a strum kind of a sound, but it's a bigger sound. And because he's playing solo guitar, again, there's no bass, there's no mandolin, there's nothing else backing him up. He's getting a lot more sound out of the guitar by hitting more strings. So. One of the weird things that I had noticed when I was learning how to play guitar as a kid, you would see these transcriptions, and they would transcribe note for note. And if somebody was picking a chord or strumming, you'd see like these clusters of notes all over the page. And I thought, how on earth is somebody going to remember how to play all of these things? Because they're all over the place. There doesn't seem to be any kind of, uh, any kind of pattern that they're sticking to. They're just all over the place. And it wasn't until years later that I that I realized, oh my gosh, they're just they're just kind of playing, right? They're just kind of doing a certain thing, and whatever happens happens. And um, in this case, that's what's happening because as I was lo learning this tune, there are a lot of things throughout this uh, song that he does that, and it's not exactly the same. So I can definitely tell you that. You know, it's more like that, and you just hear that sound, and I'm not really being too careful with what I'm hitting, except for the bass note. Um, it's like I hit the bass note, I have a strum on a couple of strings a little bit higher than that, a little bit higher than that, and a little bit higher than that. So, you don't have to be precise with only two notes, you could do three, sometimes you hit one, you know, it doesn't really matter, but listen to how it sounds when you play this. Try different chords, like maybe on a G. Like, how does that sound to you compared to maybe just strumming? Can be a little obnoxious, or, or even just doing single note arpeggios. And if I go into the way the doc is doing it, You know, that is a lot more intricate and to my ear is way nicer. So try that out. Try to any, if you're just playing rhythm, try doing alternating bass, maybe, you know, on any chord you can think of. Now, the next part I want to talk about is this last uh, little line. And I apologize for the lawn being mowed outside. Please just ignore that. And, um, what I, want to I want to talk about why does this line sound so good? Because you hear this in bluegrass music and folk music all the time, this kind of back and forth, da 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 on just a, a small range of notes, you know, it's not going over a whole octave, we're just... Right? So what's happening here? If we look at the notes that are uh, what I'm going to call target tones, goal notes, they're people, um, they are chord tones, people call these different things, but if we think about it as a target tone, it's being played over a D minor, and a target tone is going to usually be a note that's in the chord. It doesn't always have to be, it can be something like an extension or something, but here, it starts on the fifth note of D minor, which is A, right? And then it ends up on the last note on the root, on D. So if we start here, 
so you can clearly see that we start on the fifth and we end on the root. That's a very strong phrase, but rather than just going and ending it, which might be a little boring, it still works, it sounds good, it's not gonna sound terrible, but how do we embellish that so that we get a lot of notes in there, a lot of deedle deedles, to end up with our D minor chord? So in the beginning, we have this thing where we have upper and lower neighbors, right? So if you look at uh, Baroque music and things like that, there are things that are called turns. And this is not technically a turn, but we are hitting these notes that are uh, around the target tone, around the chord tone. So there's a, you have the, your target tone, you have the note that's above, and you have the note that's below, and you circle around that. So in this way, we're going... So we've hit the lower neighbor tone within the scale, that sounds good. So all I'm doing is embellishing that A note by going down a little bit and coming back up to it. And then it goes up to the upper neighbor and comes back to the target tone again. Okay, that sounds great. So, and because I'm hitting that note constantly, I'm really, from a counterpuntal way of looking at this, I'm only hitting one note. All of those things can be deduced into this one note. And I'm just embellishing that. You can do that on any chord tone. If I did it here, if I did it on D, I could do it on the third, and again on the fifth. You know, there are a lot of different ways of doing this. And uh, you can create nice musical phrases doing this as well. So, what happens now? So our next target tone is the D. Like I said, we're going down to the root. So we did this little uh, lower neighbor, upper neighbor, back to the fifth. And then it just walks right down the scale. Five, four, three, two, one, right? So, great, walks right down the scale. Nothing more easy than that. So we've, we've gone down to our target tone, and then how is that being embellished? Right? So we have da -da 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 -da, walk down the scale, and then we have this little guy that happens. So it goes up to the third, which is just in the chord, okay, nothing weird there. And then it goes to this E and a, and a C, which is actually from a C chord, arpeggiating the C chord, but it's also the upper neighbor of D, the C is the lower neighbor of D. So here you're hitting the upper neighbor, skipping the D, going down to the lower neighbor, and then going up to the D. So if I do this uh, on a linear way, if I play D here, I'm playing the upper neighbor first, lower neighbor second, and back to the note. So instead of going in the beginning, there's one way that we played it. But in the end, he go, he changes it this way, right? So we're just circling around those target tones. Uh, circle around, down the scale to it, and then back to there. So that's why that sounds so good. And try this out in your soloing. Pick out two target tones, and how are you going to do it? Uh, maybe start off. Uh, Maybe go, maybe go, right? A lot of different ways to, to do that, and it sounds great. One last thing that I wanted to talk about is the second time that he plays this solo, Doc does uh, this little idea where he goes... Right, he gets this little blues note. And what's cool is when he pulls this off, keeps this finger down, so he's still maintaining the chord. Again, he's playing solo, so he wants to keep all of these notes ringing as much as he possibly can. So he goes... And then picks that C that he's holding after the pull-off. I love that sound.
All right, so I hope you learned a lot from this video, and I hope you check out Doc Watson. If you haven't listened to him before, I had the opportunity of opening for him many years ago, and it was one of the highlights of my musical career. He's just awesome. We love Doc Watson. So please subscribe. Please like this video. Please share this video if you like this. I'm starting a new series called Acoustic Wisdom Riffs, which is going to look like this. You're going to see that in the placeholder, and I had done a series of over a hundred uh, acoustic guitar riffs, and I'm going to start putting them into this YouTube channel, just one at a time, to just going to be short little clip videos, and let me know what you think about that, and we'll see you very soon. Thanks again.